Brilliant. So it tells everybody that we're being recorded. So welcome everybody to the um, beautiful Kerry Writers Museum. It's an absolute delight to see you. I can't wait to start our gorgeous show tonight. And I'm in the best of form because I was able to go to Listo last weekend and I was able to go to um, to Billy Keane's pub and I was able to go to the museum and see all the beautiful things that are happening there and to stand in front of the castle and I'm sure you'll be seeing those pictures soon um, and then we went to Fanoog and Fanoog was in glorious sunshine and uh, Francis Kennedy told me that I took the sunshine away with me but it was just bathed in a beautiful light and they're waiting for people to come down so tonight we have Joe Brennan. Joe Brennan, everybody was saying to me, is that the fella that was on the telly? A nationwide. And it was because Joe is doing such important work. He telephones stories to people and, and it seems to me that his tongue never gets tired of telling stories. But look, we're going to bring him in there now. So hello, Joe, there you are. <laughs> Joe, it's great to see you and thanks so much for coming and I'm going to ask you to unmute so we have all those, there we there go. go, we have all those little thanks, things Maria. with, um, with uh, the technology. So Joe, tell us, you, you've become a storyteller in residence since last we spoke, can you tell us a little bit about that? Y yeah, so um, well, it's an artist in residence, but I'm the storyteller artist, so it's slightly, slightly different. Um, it's, it's at the University Hospital in Waterford. Um, they're, they're blessed down there because the hospital um, has the Waterford Healing Arts Trust um, are based on the campus and they deliver arts programs uh, within the hospital. Oh, they've been there since the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and every year they have an artist in residence program and uh, this year because of COVID it was aimed specifically at staff because it didn't look like anything was going to happen on campus mm -hmm. but things have changed a little bit so we I've been managing first of all it was just all uh, video stuff but we I've been doing some sessions outdoors Oh. Um, so we had a, I had a session today and thankfully the sun was shining. Uh, it hasn't been kind. It seems like Thursday was the day for rain. So I've stood in the drizzle. I've mm -hmm. stood in the cold. But today was beautiful. So yeah, it's been I, great. I think Wonderful. you were in the sunny southeast there, you know, Joe, you know. Well, we are indeed. Yeah. I, I, I have to tell you, I know all about uh, the Waterford Healing Trust as an IACAT member because one of the first IACAT conferences that I attended, mm -hmm. we had that lovely doctor who set it up there and he said, everybody was telling him that it was a nonsense of a dream and not to go ahead with it. But mm. he's done a load of studies on how your environment can impact your health. And they're still doing great work on that. And they have yeah. an old Gothic church with gorgeous gardens, haven't they, down there, you know? Um, yeah, and, and they have, um, well, I, I was telling just they have a healing garden on the grounds. I, I is, love that, yeah. Yeah, it's small, but it's lovely, and it's a perfect circle for storytelling. So it's been great. Yeah. <gasps> so we're all coming down to, to visit you in your garden, I'm telling you. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joe, thank you so much for coming to Kerry in the virtual. Hopefully we'll see you live sometime, you know. Well, that. absolutely. It's yeah, been a long time since I was at List All. Oh, right. We'll have to put that right. We'll have well, to. Well, that would be that would be great. I'm hoping maybe that this summer I'll get down to go across to Skellig Michael. It's been on the oh, cards for a yeah. long time. So Definitely, maybe. you know. So well, when that happens, make sure that you let us know, and we we'll, we'll organise stories around that. In the meantime, I'm going to take myself out of it, out of your way there now, Joe. You'll have 30 minutes to give us some gorgeous stories. Can't wait to hear what you have for us. And then I'll come back in and we mm -hmm. we will entertain you after that. So the, okay. the local uh, family, the little clan of the Rambling House will then entertain you back in fine style. So I can't wait for that. Nice to talk to you soon. Great. Very my God. So it's lovely to be here. And uh, it's, it's always a question of where to start 
So um, I'm here in Wexford, so I'm going to start with a, a Wexford story. And um, it's, a bit, it's a tall tale. And it's set in Kilmore Quay, a place that will be familiar, at least by reputation to many people, as a, as a, um, a fishing port um, and famous for thatched cottages that will still line the streets there. And this story is about a man called Michael Doyle. And Michael Doyle didn't fish, but he worked for a local farmer as a labourer. Now, when I say he worked, really, that is stretching the definition of the meaning of work, because in all truth, he was a lazy so-and-so. He would do as little as possible, as often as possible. He'd come in in the morning and the farmer would say, are you ready to go? I said, give me a minute now. I, I will have a cup of tea. Any excuse he could find. Well, the poor old farmer well, there was steam coming out of his ears at this stage. He was just getting fed up at this, but he didn't know how to say, I've had enough of you. But one day it became too much. He was late yet again. The farmer was sitting by the fire and he was supping a cup of tea himself, waiting anxiously for Michael to turn up. And when he did, sure, Michael Doyle saw the tea and said, ah, oh, sure, look, we have a cup of tea before we do anything. He said, now you're no cup of tea. He said, I've had enough. Get out and don't come back and blacken this door again. Oh, OK, said Michael. He took the coat and he headed off home. He got home and there was nobody there and he stretched out in front of the fire and he took up his pipe and he sat smoking away on the pipe. He was there for, well, two hours at least, puffing away when the wife came in. What are you doing here, she said. Ah, sure, the farmer told me he doesn't need me anymore. He sent me off home. Well, she said, where are we going to get money to put food on the table? You get up and get out there and find work somewhere. I don't care where or what, just do it. Ah, uh, he said, will you let me be woman? And I just finished smoking me tobacco wire. Well, the next morning she came back after being out and he was still sitting there with his feet stuck in a coal fire at this stage. And he's sucking away on the pipe and not a screed of tobacco in it where there was no money for tobacco. And she kicked his legs and said, now you get up and get out. Ah, oh, OK, he said, and he got up out of the chair and he took the coat and he headed off. And he walked down to the village, down past the Thatch cottages and he came down to the pier. And he stood on the pier and this was long before there was a marine or anything else. And there was a, a few fishing boats in and seagulls were squawking away overhead as fish was being unloaded and a few scraps being cast overboard. And he looked at the boys and he thought to himself, oh, you know, that doesn't look too hard, just lifting a few boxes. And he thought, yeah, maybe, maybe I could do that. And then he kind of raised the head a bit and he looked out over the pier wall and beyond to the sea. And the sea wasn't too rough, but he thought of all the days he had looked out there and the waves were crashing over the sea wall. And he thought to himself, <laughs> no, nah, that wouldn't be for me. So he took himself off down the borough, as it's called, and down onto the beach down there treacherous place to swim but he went up onto the dunes and he sat there with the pipe sucking in the sea air and he was looking across at the salty islands now you may have heard of the salty islands famous place for birds and at this time of the year it's a bird paradise and people are trekking over to see the puffins and the gannets and the whole lot but at once upon a time people actually lived on the island families and it just happened that Michael Doyle's great-great-grandfather had lived out there. And his own grandfather had told him stories of that great-great-grandfather who had made Pajin. And Michael Doyle thought to himself, no, I could do that. That can't be too difficult. He scratched the head of it and wondered about the Pajin. And he thought and he thought and he had a few ideas in his head. Well, off he went home and he got busy experimenting. And lo and behold, he might be lazy, but he was a cute and clever man. And he came up with a perfect batch of Pajin. Now, as I said, he was cute as well. And he decided, I'm not going to sell this around here because these boys had turned me into the police anytime. So what did he do? He went down to Waterford, over to Carlow and Kilkenny, even up into Wicklow, selling the potty. And it was a great success. He couldn't produce enough and he, he was flying out the door. He was doing so well that he decided to put the whole operation underground. He dug out a big basement under the kitchen, a trap door went down and a rug to cover over it, just in case the police should ever call. Now, the thing was, it's very hard to hide success like that. Maybe it's a bit like when you win the lotto. It's itching to get out and to buy something at least. And of course, suddenly Michael Doyle was dressed in fine clothes. He had a fine hat and coat. The children had shoes on their feet going to school and the bellies were full. And that raised questions because people wondered where was Michael Doyle getting the money from? 
and they were itching to ask him. But your luck, they never got close enough to do it. Until one day, one day, Michael was feeling very happy with a pep in his step, and he went into the local pub. And he went up to the counter and tapped on the counter, and he says, I'll have a, a, a glass of your finest Irish. The whiskey was putting it up, and he had a drink. Now, there was a few boys in the corner. You know the few boys in the corner. They're always in the corner, and they're always looking for something, and they get news. And they were itching each other and hitting each other. Go on, go on, go up and ask him. Go up and you ask him, not you ask him. And they shoved one fellow up. Paddy was his name, Paddy Murphy. And he went up. He says, uh, well, Michael, he said, you're doing well for yourself. I said, Michael, I am, I am. And uh, yeah, yeah, fine clothes. And uh, where'd you get the money from? What? He says, well, you know, did somebody like die in America or something and leave you the money? What? He said, will you go away from me? But you must be getting something. He said, get out and away from me. He went back over to the bios and they sat in the corner talking about him and giving out about him. Well, Michael Doyle had another whistle and he had another. And then Paddy was back. Go on, he says, you can tell me what it is. Well, he says, can you keep a secret? Oh, of course, I can keep a secret. He said, I'm making potching. Potching! He said, well, that's a secret. Don't tell anybody. He says, well, I haven't seen any of this potching. Ah, he said, I don't sell it around here. I sell it down in Waterford, up in Carlow and Kilkenny. You know what they're like around here? They turn me into the police in no time. No, he said, keep it quiet. Then. He went off home. And the thing is, he was full of pride. Well, sure, he was delighted that people had noticed that he was being a successful businessman. Well, except he had to keep the business quiet. He went home and he sat down on the couch and he took up the pipe and he was puffing away as happy as Larry, as they say. The next morning, he was up early and he was busy doing this, that and the other thing. And Well, by 11 o'clock, he managed to get back into the house and he sat drinking a cup of tea. Oh, he liked his cup of tea. When suddenly there was a loud pounding on the door. Who's at that door now? Oh, Mr. Doyle, it's me. It's Michael from down the road. He said, the police are on their way out here. They're coming to search your house. They say you're making pot gene. So he jumped up out of the chair and he ran to the door. He pulled it open. What are you saying, you little scut? I says, I, I'm not saying anything. I'm just telling you, I'm warning you, the police are coming. Well, he said, get away from this door now and you don't be spreading any rumours about me. Well, the door was shut and he turned and he said, now, every drop of potcheen you can find, get it out of this house before they arrive. Well, there was children flying in every direction. He was flying, the wife was flying, and they were getting rid of anything that looked half like potcheen. The trap door went down and the rug went over it and calm descended on the house. And he sat down in the chair and took a few deep breaths. Then there was a pounding on the door. He got up calmly and opened the door. And there was a big police sergeant out from Wexford town and behind him there were three other lads coming up and there was a young lad unyoking the horse and giving it some water over in the corner. Mr. Doyle, he says, we hear you're making potching on this premises. What? He said, who was spreading rumours like that about me? He said, I wouldn't have that stuff in the house that I certainly wouldn't have it past my lips. You can come in and search from top to bottom, but you won't find anything. Well, sir, that's what he said. Exactly what we have to do. We have to search from top to bottom. Well, come in. You're welcome. They came in and they searched from top to bottom. And you, the young lad, the young policeman came in after them, panting after doing all the jobs outside. And he searched from top to bottom. Now the horse, oh, well, the poor old horse was panting and parched. It wasn't quite as hot as today, but when you're pulling those three, four bios behind you, it's hard work. And there in front of him was a big bath of water. And the horse looked longingly at it and the head went down and he started to lap up. <coughs> the hood came up as fast. He had expected, well, he expected cool water, but this wasn't cool. Well, it was like fire. It was burning on the throat of them. But he liked it, so he went back for more. Meanwhile, the search went on, and of course, they found nothing. And they came back into the main room and said, we're sorry, Mr. Doyle, but you know what we had to do. Oh, he says, it's fine, I understand, but you know, the lot around here, you can't trust any of them. They're lonely, looking to spread rumours and get people in trouble for the laugh of it. Well, he said, we appreciate your cooperation. He went to the door and watched them go out. The young lad went and yoked up the horse and they all got up onto the car and they were heading out the gate. And Michael Doyle stood watching them, making sure they left and got up the road. And he watched. And he watched as the poor old horse went across this way. And then he came back across this way and he thought to himself, what is going on? And then he looked over to where the horse had been tied up and he saw the bath. Oh, good God, he said. He ran in and he says, quick, 
scatter everything you can find. We have to get out of here. The horse is drunk and they're potching. Quick, 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 quick. But there was people running in every direction, grabbing what they could. They were just about to head out the back door when the knock came to the front door. Oh, he said, we're done for. Well, he went to the door, resigned to what was coming. And when he opened the door, there was the young police officer panting. Oh, 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 Mr. Doyle, he said, you won't believe what happened. What? He said, tell me, calm down, calm down. He said, the poor horse, well, the poor horse dropped dead up the road. Oh, he said, that's awful. What happened to it? I, he said, I don't know. He was fine coming out, but he was wobbling a bit and then he just keeled over. Oh, he said, that's awful. That's awful. You must have worn the poor thing out. Oh, well, he said, look, the, the sergeant sent me back to you because he said you're the only person here in this area that he can trust. And he's going to give you 10 bob if you would get the horse cleared off the road and disposed of. And we'll come back tomorrow for the trap. Oh, he said, of course, go on, go on, I'll do that. He took the money. Now he says, you run on after them and catch up with them. It's a long way back to Wexford Town on foot. Well, the young fella took off up the road. And Doyle was quick after him to make sure the horse was off the road before somebody came and smelled its breath. Well, he arrived at the point and there was the horse, the four legs were stiff as anything straight out from the side. And he felt sorry for the horse. Of course he did, sure anybody would. But being cute, as I said already, he thought to himself, well, if I was to take the skin off the horse, I could sell that separate and make another few bob, as if he didn't have enough at this stage. So he took out the knife he always had on the belt and he sharpened it on the stone and he went at the horse and he slid down along the four legs and he peeled back the skin and then he slid all the way down the middle of the belly and he started to peel back the skin and he nearly had it all off when all of a sudden didn't the horse jump up in front of him neighing like crazy and scratching his feet on the floor well he held the skin up over the horse like this and he was trying to figure out what am I going to do and he was trying to hush the horse at one time hush hush and smooth it and he was trying to keep the skin in place while he was looking around trying to see what he could do to hold the skin in place the only thing at hand were brambles growing at the side of the road well with one hand holding the skin and he leaning down like this he managed to cut off a few lengths of brambles and he got them wrapped around the belly of the horse holding the skin just about. But well, he got some more brambles then and each of the four legs he wound up along. Each of the four, one, two, three, four. And he put a few more around the belly just to make sure. Now he said, I'll bring the horse home. It's getting dark at this stage. And he thought, I'll fix it properly in the morning. He put the horse out in the shed and he went off to bed. Next morning, he was up bright and early and went to look after the horse. Now the horse wasn't very happy when he saw the bright light, but a job had to be done. He led the horse outside and he wondered what was the best thing to replace the brambles with and he thought natural twine that will do the job that's natural and it'll probably fit in with the skin so he got the ball of natural twine and a, a needle and he went to start his work but of course the first job he had to do was to take the brambles off and he gripped the back leg and he pulled at the bramble it wouldn't budge he tried the other leg he tried the two four legs and it wouldn't budge and he went to the belly thinking that would be softer and he pulled and it wasn't going to budge. It had taken root in the body of the horse. Well, what could he do but leave it there? And he left the brambles in place and he put the horse out into the field behind. And the brambles, they started to grow. And people laughed. They laughed when they saw the little pink and white flowers appear in the springtime. They laughed when the berry started to form, the hard green berry, and it grew and it fattened and it changed colour to red and eventually to black. Beautiful, juicy blackberries. And Michael Doyle wasn't going to miss another turn. So he picked those blackberries and he made himself some blackberry jam. And I have to tell you, it's the most delicious blackberry jam that you will taste. You spread it on a hot scone or a bit of brown bread and you take a bite and the sweetness fills your mouth and it slips down your throat and then you feel it. A little bit of burn from the potgeen and it warms the belly and it's only delicious. And that is the story. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I loved that. I'm your audience, Joe. I was skipping along to that. That was brilliant. Carry good. on. Good, good. So, um, yeah, that's a great, great old story. Um, of course, there's always debate about these stories and where they belong. Uh, um, I'm trying to think now, Aideen, Aideen, I'm forgetting Aideen's surname from Carlo and her dad, Jack, and they were saying, oh, that's a Carlo story. 
And I was like, no, no, it's the Wexford story, but you're, they travel, they travel wide and they travel far. So this next story, uh, I think we might actually travel a bit further afield and we might even leave the country for this one. And it's the story that comes from Russia. Um, and I find there's many of the Russian tales, there's something about them that are very similar in ways um, to Irish stories, to themes or, or whatever that goes on. And, and, I, and I've spoken to a few Russian people uh, and they've said the Irish folk tales, um, like, like, like the ones we have told, uh, are, would work very well there. And I've been lucky enough to get over to Russia and, and share stories. And, and there's a great, great affinity. I don't, I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's because they were such a rural country and, and, and uh, the peasantry, um, just the people of the land. Maybe it's that, I'm not sure what it is. But this story, well, there's a bit of a tall tale about this one. But in this story, there's a man and his wife and they have a small little cottage. We're so used to those small little cottages and a bit of ground around to grow stuff. Now the ground was, not very good. All you could, they could grow in it were a few turnips. And they had a few chickens. And every day, the husband would gather the eggs and head into the market and sell the eggs. Why, meanwhile, the wife was at home and she did the hard work of digging. And one day, she was digging away when suddenly the spade hit something and it was a loud clang. Her first thoughts were for the spade. If it broke, they couldn't afford to replace it. She lifted it up. Oh, she sighed with relief. The blade was fully intact. But what had it hit? It was definitely metal. But she went down and she scraped away the ground. And then she found a box, a metal box. And the, the lock had broken. And when she lifted it, she found gold. When well, she closed the lid straight away. She didn't want anybody to see the gold because, well, in those days, the king owned everything, including them, but especially anything of value like gold. If he heard about this, he would say, it's my gold, and take it away. She couldn't let anybody find out. And there was another problem, because her husband, well, he had what you might call a loose jaw. He was a gossiper. Everything he would tell to everybody else, he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Everything came spilling out, including his innermost thoughts. But she thought to herself, what am I going to do? because he won't keep it quiet if I tell him. So there's only one thing I have to do, and that's I have to sneak it into the house and keep it a secret. Well, she thought on it for long and hard. And by the time night fell and he was home, she had it planned well. They went up to the bed. And within a short time, he was snoring away happily beside her. She crept out of the bed, went outside, got the shovel and got the gold and brought it indoors. Now the floor of the kitchen was only an earthen floor and she started to dig. And she was digging away when suddenly the spade hit a rock and there was a clang. Well, she froze. No sound from above. Oh, she thought. And she went back about to put her foot on the spade when suddenly she heard, wife, what was that sound? Oh, it's nothing, she said. Go, go back to sleep, will you? And suddenly the candle was coming down the stairs and the candle fell on the box and the box was open. Gold, he said. Is that ours? Shh. That you can't tell anybody about it, husband. If you tell anybody, the king will find out and then he will say it's his. Oh, but it's ours. I know it's ours, but he will say it's his and well, he's the king. Oh, he said, I won't tell anybody. I, I can keep a secret. <laughs> yes, dear, she said. Well, she finished burying the gold and they both went back to bed. Oh, but in a short time, well, sure, he was snoring again, but she wasn't. She lay awake trying to figure out how she was going to stop this secret falling past his lips and falling on the ears of the king. And there was no way he was going to stop. But as dawn approached, a plan formed in her head. And before the sun had risen above the horizon, she crept out of the bed, grabbed her basket and headed into the village so that she was early as the shops opened. The first shop she went to was the fishmongers, and there she bought 12 silver trout. She went to the bakers and bought cakes and buns, and then she went to the butchers and bought three strings of plump sausages. She went home, smiling all the way with a quick step beneath her. And she didn't go into the cottage, but she passed on and she went in to the forest. And when she came to the forest, she stopped and she gathered up the cakes and buns and she placed them up in the branches of the tree. She went on a bit further and she emerged out into a grassy area and there she set the 12 silver trout 
swimming in the grass. And she went on a bit further to the river where her husband had fishing lines to catch trout. She pulled in the lines, nothing as usual, and hooked the sausages on and fed them in to the river. She went home. And when she came in the door, she called, husband, 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 wake up, wake up, wake up. Oh, he said, oh, what's the matter? What's the matter? Oh, she said, it's been rain and cakes and buns. What, he said, rain and cakes and buns? Hey, are you crazy woman? No, she said, it's true. It was raining cakes and buns and I know it. And I know they are there. Hurry up, quick, we have to get them. Oh, well, it had been a strange night. There was something about gold that was forming in his head and he just grabbed his clothes and he followed her out into the forest. And then they arrived at the start of the path and she, he looked up and said, oh, cakes and buns, it's true. It was raining cakes and buns. I told you, husband, quickly gather them up, gather them up. And they filled the basket with cakes and buns. Oh, he said, this is wonderful. Does it rain cakes and buns often? Well, not so often, but you have to know when it is. And well, in future, hurry up when I tell you they're there. Okay, he said. Now she said, when it rains cakes and buns, well then sometimes, well sometimes the fish swim in the grass. Oh, wife, he said, fish swimming in the grass. That's, a, that's surely that's not possible. You didn't believe me about the cakes and buns, husband? Well, so they walked on. And as they walked, suddenly he stopped and said, oh, you're right. There they are. Look, swimming in the grass. And he ran and he picked them up as quick as he could in case they'd swim it away. And then he looked at her and smiled and said, aren't you wonderful? And she smiled back. Yes, I guess I am. Now she said, another surprise, because when the fish swim in the grass, well, the sausages, they swim in the river. Ah, oh, wife. Now, sausages cannot swim anywhere. Well, you didn't believe me about the buns and you didn't believe me about the fish. So do you want to check? He wanted to say no, but of course he needed to know the correct answer. So he ran on to the fishing lines and he pulled them in and there they were, the three strings of sausages. Oh, he said, this is amazing. <laughs> you are so clever. And they went home and they had a feast of a breakfast. Now she said, your belly is full, go to the market and sell the eggs. He gathered up the eggs and he skipped off into the market. But as he was coming towards the village, he remembered gold. I saw gold last night. It was there, it was, it was in the kitchen. And the wife said, and she said not to tell anybody. Oh, I can't tell anybody, but it's so, oh, I can't tell anybody because the king, he went into the village and bit his lip as he went to all the places he normally went and all the people asked him, what news, what news? And oh, he had news, but he couldn't tell them till he came at last to his best friend who he told everything. He trusted him with his life. He couldn't keep it in any longer. He said, we found gold on our land. Gold, he said, are you rich? Well, he said, uh, yes, isn't it wonderful? Oh, it is wonderful. But he said, you can't tell anybody because when the king finds out, he'll, he'll take it from us. Oh, he said, you can trust me. He went home happy, happy that he had let out the secret because now somebody knew. And he was so happy because they were so rich. Two days later, the guards arrived from the palace. Of course, he hadn't kept the secret. Who can keep secrets like that? Very few. He had told somebody and said, don't tell anybody. Of course, they told somebody and said, don't tell anybody. And it went from one person to one person to one person to the next village to the next village, the village, the town, the city, to the ears of the king. Gold, he said, on my land, bring this peasant here and I want my gold. The guards were dispatched and they found the little cottage and they knocked on the door and said, the king wants his gold. We don't have any gold here, said the wife. Well, your husband has been telling everybody that you found gold. My husband, she said, oh, you can't believe anything he says. Well, the king wants his gold. You have to come before him. Well, reluctantly, they set off. She knew it would happen and she was prepared. They arrived at the palace and they came in and the king said, now I hear you have found gold, my gold on my land. And the wife said, sorry, sire, we, but we didn't find any gold. What, he said, your husband has been telling people that you found gold and that you're rich. Of course, it's my gold, you can't keep it. 
Oh, she said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to have wasted your time. But my husband, well, you, well, you can't believe my husband. Well, he, he well, he's crazy. He, he's as mad as the March Hare. That's not fair, he said. I'm not crazy. I saw the gold. You did, said the king. Yes, he said. It was on the kitchen floor. It was there. And I, I, I did. I saw it with my own eyes. And the king looked and said, when did you see this gold? Well, he said, um, who? He said, it was the night before it rained cakes and buns. What, said the king? It rained cakes and buns? Yes, he said. My wife knows when it rains cakes and buns. Tell him, tell him. She just smiled and shrugged her shoulders. And also the fish, well, they were swimming in the grass. Fish swimming in the grass? Yes, he said. And not only that, I caught sausages in the river. Three plump rows of sausages. Tell him, wife, tell him. And she just shrugged her shoulders and said, I know not. The king looked and he felt sorry for the poor woman. And the place, well, they were sniggering and laughing. They were trying to hold it in. It was about to burst out. And you know what? The king just let it out and the whole place fell about laughing. And then he put his hand up to shush. And he says, I am sorry for you. I am sorry because, well, he's your husband. But I guess you love him. But nobody should ever believe another word that comes from this man's lips. Go home, he said. Take care of him. And they left the palace. And the poor husband, his head was hanging and he was kept looking at her and he tried to speak, but no words would come out. He'd look again and go. He was lost for words. No harm, thought the wife. And they went home. And now when he went into the village to sell the eggs and he was about to say something, people would laugh and say, oh, we can't believe anything you tell us. And eventually he stopped trying. Nobody would listen to him. Nobody would entertain him. And then, well, then his wife dug up the gold. And he looked at the gold. And he smiled. And they were rich. They didn't flaunt their wealth. But they never had to worry again. Their bellies would be full. And they were taken care of. And that's the story. Of the fish in the forest. Thank you. Oh. What a great story, Joe. I, I know you probably couldn't see all the faces, but we were all roaring laughing. I can't uh -huh. wait. I actually can't wait for the live sessions again so that you'll be able to see the reactions. And we're getting some we're getting some lovely comments. Brilliant story. Okay. Got to love a clever woman. Definitely. <laughs> you know, yeah. so. Yeah. I'll give you the opposite of that. Have we time for another one? Is time how are we, we doing? Absolutely on time? have time for another one. Um and also we'll be bringing you in at the end. So yeah. so would you do another one now and another one at the end? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do a short one now. Brilliant. Uh, what uh, how long have this been? I'm thinking 20 minutes about, is it? Um it, we're just over the 30 minutes now. Oh, are we? Listen, <laughs> we don't we don't worry about the clock when we're having a great time. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you a short one to counterbalance that one. Um, and uh, it's a story that some people may remember, the wonderful John Campbell from Armagh. And uh, if anybody ever saw him over the years, I'm sure he was in Listowel many times. He had such great stories. And this was one of his. And uh, so in this story, it goes back to a time when there was a highwayman up in that neck of the woods. And he was on the roads and there was a farmer heading in to do some business at the market. And the wife said, what about the highwayman? And he says, ah, oh, don't be worrying about the highwayman. But, 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 but he said, if you sell all your produce and he stops you, then we've nothing. And he thought for a second, he says, I know what I'll do. I'll bring the wee girl with me. He won't touch her. She can hold on to the money. Now the wife wasn't so sure about this. You know, the wee girl was innocent and whatever, but she reluctantly agreed. And off they went. They brought the horse and the trap and they went into the town, did their business and got a good price for what they had to sell. Well, when they were about to set home, he looked at the girl and said, maybe we'll be fine. But just in case, just in case that highwayman stops us, I'm going to give you the money and you keep it safe. He won't lay a finger on a wee girl like you. So she took the money and they headed off back towards home. And they weren't far from home when all of a sudden out stepped the highwayman, sitting up on his horse with a mask above his nose, pre-COVID, but there it was. And he looked down and he says, give me your money. 
money, said the farmer. We don't have any money. But you've been to the mark, market and you sold, pro oh, he said, we got a very poor price and all we did was buy some food. No, no, we've nothing. He said, get down from there and I'll search you. And he searched him from head to toe. And of course, he found no money. He searched in his boots and in his sock. All the places that the highwayman knew a man could hide money. And he said, nothing. And then he looked up at the girl. And what about her? Oh, he said, she's only a wee lass. I wouldn't entrust money to her. It would be too much of a responsibility. And he says, well, down you come. He said, you do not lay a, he a hand on that girl. And he said, you be quiet. There's money to be had and it's mine. And he searched the wee girl. And the farmer looked very nervous and he watched and he waited, dreading the moment that the money was found. And he found nothing. Well, now the farmer was as confused as anybody else. And the highwayman was confused because you were sure they had money, but not to be found. So instead he said, I'll take the horse instead and you can walk home. The highwayman took the horse and they disappeared off down the road, laughing away to himself. Well, once he had gone out of sight, the farmer turned to the wee girl and said, where's the money? And with that, she opened her mouth and stuck out her tongue. And there was the money sitting on her tongue. Well, he laughed. He said, by God, it's a pity your mother wasn't here. We would have saved the horse as well. And that's the story. Oh, my goodness. I just wasn't. You have, have to keep balance. <laughs> Got to keep balance. Oh, I loved it. Loved it, Joe. That was brilliant, you know. Yeah. So we, we, we actually have had some lovely comments since last we spoke. So Great. we have a, we have guests in from Nova Scotia. And ah, can we hear them laughing across the ocean? Can you hear them, Joe? Hi. You see, <laughs> there's great connections between Wexford and Waterford and Nova Scotia. There is, yeah, even, there even is. in the accent. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I worked in Toronto one summer as a security guard and uh, the, actually shared a house with uh, three three uh, people from Newfie. Uh, or no, not not Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. Well, it was Nova Scotia is we're talking about. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure of the geography, I'm afraid, but I'm sure yeah, they no, Nova us. Scotia is, is different. Yeah, no, it's a yeah. little bit different. But I actually shared a house with a guy from Nova Scotia as well. Craig from Nova Brilliant. Scotia. And, and great yes. music there. Great great, yeah, <laughs> great Cajun yeah. music there as well. Yeah. So, Joe, um, I'm giving a big old shout out to our gorgeous Lizzie. She's out of hospital today. So, um, you know, so Liz is like the grand dam of uh, stories in Northern Ireland. And we were oh, all, yeah, we were all thinking of her today. So uh, I just want her to know that we're, we're giving you a big old shout out, Lizzie. And oh, yeah. we're, we're looking forward to seeing her the month after next. She'll be here. So, ah, great. Great, yeah. Great. So yeah. I'm going to give you a break, Joe. And when you come back, we, it'll uh -huh. be the end of the session and you, you tell us a tale to send us home. 